Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm going to talk this morning about some of the things that I do when I'm not standing in this pulpit. Did you know that pastors don't live at church? Isn't that funny? It's just like your second grade teacher doesn't actually live at school. We don't live at church, and we have other lives. Um, and we have part of our relationship with God, and I know this is true for you as well, it takes place in this building, yes, but also in our houses, in our workplace as we're walking down the street. And so I want to talk a little bit this morning about some of the ways that we experience the new life, the resurrection power of God when we're not at church. One of the things that I do when I'm not at church uh, in the evenings is I try to exercise, and every once in a while I do some yoga. I don't go to a class because that's more than I can handle, but I have a TV and I have a video, and I do these yoga uh, poses. And sometimes, in the kind of yoga I do, you have to hold the pose for a really, really long time. Those of you who have done yoga may have experienced this sort of, exp of holding. Uh, so while I was doing yoga in my living room on my rug, I was seated on the floor with my foot underneath me. And I was sitting on my foot for a really, really long time. And then the teacher said, it's time to get up. And I tried to get up. And my foot felt like it was no longer there at all. We had been sitting for so long that my foot had fallen completely asleep. It felt like my life ended at my ankle. This foot was so far asleep. But there was more yoga class to do, and so I shook out my foot a little bit, and some sensation returned, and I shook my foot a little bit more, and I got to that pins and needles stage of when something wakes up, and it started to really hurt. And then I stood up to do the rest of the yoga class, put my full weight on that foot, and it really, really hurt. But as I was continuing through my yoga class, paying attention to my body and to my feet, I realized that after I had entered the next pose, somehow that foot that had been completely cut off from the rest of my body, that foot that had felt like it was full of pins and needles poking me in the sole of my foot, had come back to life. When I wasn't even looking, when I wasn't even trying, my foot had come back to life. Our whole tradition is grounded on liberation and resurrection, being set free and being restored to life after it feels like we have died. And this process, I think, is kind of like what happens when your hand or your foot falls asleep. It astonishes you it hurts, and it doesn't happen all at once. It takes time, and being patient with coming back to life, taking time, is one of the hardest spiritual practices we're asked to engage in. The church this, in the spring celebrates Good Friday, the day Jesus died, and it celebrates Easter, the day Jesus came back to life. But we don't do a whole lot with Saturday, Holy Saturday. We don't know what happened in that tomb. We don't know what happened to Jesus' body, to Jesus' spirit. All we know is he was dead, and then he was alive. But our tradition reminds us that even though we don't know what happened in the middle, there was a middle. Even for Jesus, resurrection took time. And I find great hope in that when it seems to be taking too long for me as well. In the scripture that Joe read about the valley of dry bones, it's from the book of Ezekiel, who peace be upon him as a prophet in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Ezekiel writes about this valley of dry bones and his vision that he has of God taking him out to a land that's filled with death, that's filled with skeletons, that's filled with scattered bones. And God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's response is, only you know, God. 
Only you know. Ezekiel is pretty clear that if resurrection is possible, it's not something that he can do on his own. But slowly, layer by layer, the bones are attached to tendons, the tendons are attached to muscle, the muscle is attached to skin, and whole people start to appear in this valley. But they're not made into new people, brought forth all the way from their graves, until God's Spirit breathes upon them. Even for God, resurrection takes time. It's a process. There's a stage at which that skeleton isn't quite a skeleton, but it's not quite a whole human being yet. And the last stage of that process, God does the same thing that God does in the second creation story in the book of Genesis. God breathes God's spirit into the people. And that is when they finally come back to life. Can these bones live? God asks. Only you know, Ezekiel responds. And Ezekiel waits for God's spirit to move through what seemed to be dead. One of the other things I do when I'm not in this building, because I don't live here, thanks be to God, um, the sanctuary is nice, but it's not a great place to, to live. Uh, one of the other things I do is I work with the National Alliance of Mental Illness. NAMI is the name of the group. Once a week, I uh, co-facilitate a support group for people living with mental illness. And every week, the people who come into this group seem to be like skeletons. They have been ravaged by whatever is happening in their life by whatever is happening in their mind, and they are convinced, many of them, that this is the end of the line and there is no hope. And every week, I watch in that hour and a half long meeting as these people who seemed to look like skeletons, and sometimes those people are me, who seems to look like a skeleton, experience a profound sense of the Spirit of God moving through that community And they walk out of that hour and a half long meeting, maybe not completely healed, maybe not completely restored to health, but they walk out not as the same person that they walked in as. The spirit moving through community is a profound thing, and sometimes it's not a complicated thing at all. As I sit with this group, the most Uh, the deepest sense of spirituality, the deepest sense of something holy appearing in that community is when one person asks for help and the other person gives it. And you would think it would be some complicated thing, like how can I heal from schizophrenia? But these things that people ask for are so tiny. They're often things like, do you know the name of a good dentist? And sometimes, yes, I do. I do know the name of the good dentist. Being able not only to give help, but also to receive help is one of the channels through which the Holy Spirit flows. It's one of the reasons here at this church that we know that the Spirit is present in our community. Whether it's a valley of dry bones or a support group or a church parking lot, there are places in our world that are way stations, that are healing places where someone who feels like a skeleton can stop and rest for a while and feel themselves slowly being brought back to life. Slowly, through a process that takes more time than we wish it did, our bones and our muscles and our skin are reassembled as the Spirit blows through us. And we once again become whole. The spirit can flow through the valley of dry bones. It can flow through my foot that's been asleep. It can flow through communities like a NAMI support group or a safe parking program. And the spirit can bring the earth itself back to life. A few miles down the road, on the way to the South Center Mall, Off of I-5 is a section of Tukwila that appeared to be dead. 
It was a place where people threw their garbage. It was a place where Boeing dumped its waste. It was a place where no one walked and no one went. And two years ago, in 2021, King County, along with its friends, began what they called the Chinook Wind Mitigation Project. It's about six or seven miles down the Duwamish River. And through a lot of hard work, through digging up the dirt, if not digging up the dry bones themselves, what was once a wasteland was restored to marsh, a mudflat habitat where insects and fish and frogs and all sorts of creatures live. And the intent of this habitat across from the South Center Mall is that it is a place where salmon can rest. Salmon, many of you know, are sometimes saltwater fish and they're sometimes freshwater fish. And they need a place in between as they transition from one habitat to another. About this area of Tukwila, the county says this project includes off-channel aquatic and intertidal mud flat habitat. Intertidal means between two things, between two bodies of water. Friends, I believe that when the Spirit is truly flowing through us, whether we're in a tomb or a cemetery or an abandoned marshland, that the Spirit sometimes does its best work when we are between, when we are between dead and alive, when we are between abandonment and wholeness, when we are between having a house that wasn't safe and finding a new place to live where we too can experience abundant life. There's a poet named Wendell Berry who writes a lot about the intersection between Christianity, between faith and conservation. Uh, Too often those things have been kept separate, and we've been talking in our church a lot this month about how part of our responsibility as people of faith is to be responsible not only to God and our human neighbors, but to care of the earth itself. And in his poem, Mad Mad Farmer's Liberation Front, Barry talks a lot about one of the ways that we find our liberation is by paying attention to the places of our earth that seemed to be dead, but are actually about to spring forth new life. He writes about how so much of our focus is on harvesting things that have grown, and so little of our focus is on leaves that are slowly becoming spoil. He talks about how the two inches of hummus that forms a new tree takes a thousand years to form, and what a miracle it is to wait for that soil. But his poem ends like this. He talks about things that are dead, carry on right, the things that vultures come and eat. And he writes this, listen to carry on to the things that are dead. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world, he writes. Expect the end of the world and practice resurrection. So this week, as you walk through valleys of dry bones, as you feel like you may be shut in a tomb for three days, as you walk it through those in-between places where you've left one thing but not yet arrived at another, I pray that you will remember to practice resurrection. Amen.